Okay. Go back. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about today. Uh, today, uh, talk about transparent snarks from dark compilers, and this is joint work with Ellen Chapenyak and Ben Fish, who I borrowed uh, a lot of the slides from. So what is the summary of the results today? So we already heard a lot in this week about polynomial commitments. So this is also going to be about polynomial commitments. And especially, it's going to be a new polynomial commitment scheme with a transparent setup, so no trusted setup, which has uh, log size evaluation proofs and log size verification. And this gives us through uh, for example, through Libra or a lot of the other talks we saw this week, this directly gives us a transparent setup snark for arithmetic circuits with logarithmic proof size and logarithmic verification time and uh, using the fiat Shamir transform uh, on, on, on a multi-round public coin argument. So uh, Yael asked before, what is a polynomial commitment scheme? Well, so a polynomial commitment scheme is a commitment uh, to a polynomial of degree d and the commitment is ideally short. And then it enables these small proofs that evaluate the polynomial over some finite field on a point z and also prove that the degree of the polynomial is bounded. So often these, these uh, protocols prove both. So a little bit more formally, we have a setup algorithm which uh, generates the public parameter, a commitment, an opening, just like in a normal commitment. But then we also have this evaluation protocol, which might be interactive, where the prover can uh, claim that there exists a polynomial which is in the commitment and that the polynomial correctly evaluated at a point is equal to some other value. And ideally, as I said, uh, the, the, we want the commitment to be small and we want the communication to be sublinear in D for univariate polynomial, or if we're talking about a multivariate polynomial, then we want the communication to be sublinear in the uh, total number of coefficients in the polynomial. And uh, the security properties that we want are just the standard uh, commitment binding property. I won't talk about hiding or zero knowledge in this talk, uh, but you can also achieve that. And for the evaluation protocol, there's, there's two different notions. One is a, a sort of a, a binding property that I cannot evaluate the same polynomial at the, the, the same commitment at, at the same point to two different values. The other one is, is a knowledge uh, property, which we will achieve, where I can prove to you every time I evaluate the polynomial on any point, it is actually possible to extract the underlying polynomial. And uh, we will achieve this, this argument of knowledge property. And ideally, what we would want is a transparent setup, where the setup has no secrets and is, is publicly ver verifiable. So, Trust the setup, transparent setup. There's multiple words for it now. And previous constructions for, for um, polynomial commitments, uh, other than the one that we saw before, uh, used by linear maps. And they especially they use this trusted setup where you have um, a, a CRS which commits to all of the monomials of a secret evaluation point. So there's the secret point S, which the setup chooses. And then the CRS is just the monomials um, of this polynomial up to some degree d. And in this work, we, we achieve this uh, polynomial commitment scheme with transparent setup, constant size communication, uh, commitment, and only logarithmic communication and evaluation uh, and verification time in eval. And uh, why do we do this? Well, mostly to make Riyadh happy. It's a gift because it was on his, on his wish list. But also, as we've heard a lot this week, uh, because we can build snarks from it. So just to very quickly recap, what is a snark? Well, it is a, it is a proof where the prover proves that he knows the witness to some relation, or so to say uh, we often talk about circuits. So um, it knows inputs to the circuit uh, that computes the relation such that it's true. And we want the succinctness property that the proof is very short. We also want efficiency in that the verification time should also be short, ideally polylogarithmic. And we want an extraction property saying that there exists an extractor which can uh, ex extract the witness from a prover that <laughs> succeeds on, um, uh, with, with a non-negligible probability. So, uh, and ideally we want this snark without a, with a transparent setup where um, there's no secrets in this uh, setup, so everybody can publicly verify that the setup was done correctly. So unlike in, in 
these uh, GGPIO-based snarks where you have to trust that the setup was done correctly, for example, in Zcash, and uh, sometimes they even go wrong, um, as in Zcash. Uh, but uh, here, if we don't have this trusted setup, then everybody can just run an algorithm to check that the setup was done correctly. And the idea to achieve this is, is sort of to follow uh, Uvald's framework for using an, an, an uh, information theoretic thing, namely a polynomial IOP, which I'll define in a second, and turn that into an efficient interactive proof using a polynomial commitment. And then uh, if this is a public coin protocol, then we can use the fiat Shamir transform to again compile this, another cri cryptographic compilation step to turn this into a non-interactive proof, a, a snark. This step would be an inductive argument, right? Uh, this is a, yes, an argument. Um, I mean, I guess if you have a, yeah, I guess it would be hard to achieve succinctness uh, without an argument here. Yes, yeah. No, because, I mean, that efficient I mean if the, Okay. So well, I, mean, I guess it depends on the properties of the co polynomial commitment scheme. But uh, no, I guess if you want succinct description. Okay, uh, so this would be a doubly in, uh, efficient interactive argument. And uh, we already saw this, this uh, comparison before. And the one thing uh, that I want to focus on is that there's no, previously there was no snark that has, uh, does this work? That has uh, logarithmic proof purely logarithmic proof size and verification time and doesn't have uh, other than snarks, but they have the trusted setup. So this is the first snark that achieves, uh, it's a first practical snark, I mean, other than, than, than CS proofs, which use very heavy uh, PCPs, and that achieves uh, logarithmic proof size and logarithmic verification time. And uh, again, the recipe that we'll use is, is uh, from Yuval's talk that we'll have some and this is, in general, the recipe for, for, for uh, creating these proof systems is to have some information theoretic proof system and then compile it. And uh, uh, one information theoretic proof system is a linear PCP. And we already heard about this. And the idea of a linear PCP is that uh, I have some proof vector. And then I can, the verifier can make oracle queries to this proof vector that return uh, an inner product between the query vector and the proof. And uh, IKO showed that uh, you can, using uh, linear homomorphic encryption, you can create a four-move linear PCP into a snark, so a, a, a succinct proof, but with a linear verification time and quadratic proving time, and then uh, as a compiler using linear homomorphic encryption. And then the work by GGPR showed that uh, we can uh, create a, um, a QAP-based linear PCP using linear-only encryption to something that has constant verification time and constant proof sets. Um, and the way that these QAPs work, or these R1 CS preprocessing uh, snarks work at a very high level is that the queries are pushed into this preprocessing step. And they're hidden by, uh, there's a hidden random alpha chosen by the trusted setup. And in the compilation into a, a linear interactive proof, we use this linear only encoding, which forces the prover to basically apply the right query vectors. So I, I push the query vectors into the setup, and then I somehow need to force the prover to only be able to do these linear queries, so not do any you know, quadratic queries or, or something else with the proof. And uh, this is done using, using a heavy cryptographic tool called linear-only encoding. And the problem is that this approach appears to fundamentally require sort of a trusted setup, because I really need to push these, um, these, uh, these, these uh, query vectors into the, uh, into the uh, setup. And there's another, another information theoretic object that we heard about this week, our interactive oracle proofs which are um, the, the Oracle proofs, so PCPs, uh, where the verifier just checks, does point queries, so he, he just checks random points. And um, the interactive Oracle proofs are the multi-round version of this, where in every round the prover sends some uh, Oracle to a proof, and then the verifier can query this Oracle. And uh, the 
uh, nice thing about IOPs is that we can uh, compile it very efficiently and it has great efficiency gains over classical PCP and has very lightweight uh, compilation that for only uses symmetric key cryptography. And uh, we can build, uh, you know, we can build Starks and Aurora and, and, and even polynomial commitment schemes from it. But in general, they have uh, sort of the, the proof size is still uh, log n squared. Unless you use very heavy uh, cryptography again, and then you can bring that down a little bit or you can bring that down. But uh, it seems sort of if you really want to gain the benefits of it, you have to deal with a relatively large proof size. I mean, it's uh, still polylogarithmic, but you know, uh, since we already have that, we want to do better. So what about sort of combining these things, right? A linear PCP is, is, um, is a single round thing, and an and IOP is a multi-round thing. So what if we have a linear IOP? And uh, this was recently explored by, by uh, Henry and others and Yuval, and uh, it, it turns out that this actually gives you some, uh, some new interesting properties. But uh, we can even extend that, or we will use a subclass of these linear IOPs, which are polynomial IOPs. So what is a polynomial IOP? Well, the idea is that every query is not some, uh, it's not generic linear queries. The query is just a polynomial evaluation. So clearly this is a subclass of a linear IOP because I can always express a polynomial evaluation as an inner product, as, as uh, Yupeng just said, I can express it as an inner product between the monomials of the, the, the evaluation point and the coefficients. So um, this is, uh, so what if we you know, want to do a little bit more? What if we want to do coordinate queries or inner product between the coefficients and other oracles? And we actually show in our paper that there is a generic reduction between these information uh, theoretic objects. So with a polynomial PCP, it's, it's uh, actually there's a, you know, as long as I can uh, do these queries, then I can also do point queries. I can sort of show you that one of the coefficients has some value. So this gives us kind of this hierarchy that uh, linear PCPs are, are the most powerful thing, and, and the subset of them are polynomial PCPs, which are more general than point PCPs. And, and the IOPs are just the multi-round version of the, so this is what you send in each round in an IOP, and then an IOP is a multi-round version of this information theoretic object. So uh, now uh, how do we compile that? Or um, I guess first I'll show you some polynomial IOPs for MP. So uh, we heard about Sonic, which is a polynomial IOP. It's a two-round polynomial IOP for any NP relation that makes one bivariate query and three uh, univariate queries uh, to a polynomial overall. The problem is that bivariate queries are the, the bivariate query is, is uh, or the bivariate polynomial is quadratic in the size of the circuit. So uh, they also show a, a nice transform that you can transform this to a five, five round polynomial IOP with 24 univariate oracle queries of degree uh, size of the circuit. And uh, for uniform circuits, so if you can the bivariate polynomial is basically a description of the circuit. So for uniform circuits, if you can evaluate this very efficiently, then uh, you can just use the, the two-round version of the IOP, and the verifier can just evaluate the circuit polynomial locally. So uh, this is a very nice property of this protocol. And uh, what we do is we apply the new commitment to Sonic, and we get uh, a trustless snark with, uh, with log n proof size and log n verification time. And practically, this is also fairly short, not as short as, as, as uh, sort of uh, bilinear snarks, but uh, less than 10 kilobytes. So for this uh, abstraction, should I think of these as univariate polynomials that are going back and forth in the, in the proof, or are they, can they be multivariate? So uh, we support the polynomial commitment scheme. Uh, it's, it's for multivariate polynomials. So uh, I guess uh, Sonic only uses, in the end, uh, it compiles it to something that only uses univariate polynomial, but our polynomial commitment scheme supports both univariate as well as multivariate polynomials. And uh, actually, this uh, comes here. So in, in work, uh, Spartan, so these are proof systems that are based on uh, multi-prover proof systems. And uh, in Spartan, you can uh, basically show, reduce the satisfiable of any circuit C to, to this, this check over uh, a multivariate polynomial. I think it's actually a multilinear polynomial. 
Um, and uh, you have three uh, witness, or one witness uh, polynomial of degree one, and then you have these uh, polynomia describing the circuit, which at least in, in Spartan have three log C variables, and we've also heard Libra, which uh, uses sort of, uh, has, has the dependence on the depth of the circuit, but brings this down to uh, log C variables, and, and there's this whole family of, of GKR-based protocols, which, uh, as Yu Peng just showed so nicely in the last talk, uh, can also use a polynomial commitment scheme. So they also fall into this category of polynomial IOPs. And uh, I guess the theorem uh, in, in, in this paper is that there exists a polynomial IOP for any relationship which uh, uses a three log C variate multilinear uh, polynomial. And for uniform circuits, uh, you can again evaluate this polynomial locally so you only have to do three queries to, to these uh, smaller polynomials. So let's talk about the main construction. Uh, so how do we do uh, the, the step one in our new polynomial commitment is to encode the polynomial as an integer. So we have a polynomial f of degree at most d. And I will only talk about the univariate case. This also extends to multivariate polynomials. But you'll have to trust me on that. So the idea is we want to uh, encode this polynomial as an integer. And we do this very simply by just evaluating the polynomial at a point Q, such that Q is larger than, than uh, the size of any of the coefficients. So we, we first uh, lift the polynomial to the integers, which is one yeah. important point. And then each of the coefficients is now between 0 and p. And uh, then we evaluate it at a point Q. And to make this very concrete, Say we have a polynomial of 4x cubed plus 2x and so on, and we're over z5. Uh, so then if q is equal to 10, then the evaluation of the polynomial is just the sort of each digit is, uh, is a coefficient in the polynomial. So uh, you can see right here, this is 4, 2, 1, 3. Um, and, and in general, this is sort of the intuition for the encoding. And this also shows that the, the, the size of the encoding is uh, roughly, or it's between, I think, q to the d and q to the d plus 1. So it's as, as the encoding is as long as, as the polynomial itself. But we've now encoded it as an integer. Can you give me p to the d? q to the d. Well, q is greater or equal to p. We'll see in a second why we want it maybe to be greater than p. So right. now we're reducing p. Right, right, right. But so this f uh, hat to the q should represent, it's, it's an injective map. But right, it's an injective map, exactly. It's an injective map from polynomials with bounded degrees to integers. But it needs to contain this p to the d amount of information. Yeah, and q to the d is larger than, is larger than p to the d. Uh, so the reason why we want q to be larger than p is, uh, well, actually, first, uh, let's state some facts. So uh, every integer is uh, uniquely decodable to an integer polynomial with, with small positive coefficients. And uh, the, we can also uh, decode it. Uh, this is the variant for, for, for if we want the coefficients to be both po uh, positive and negative. Then. Uh, but the other fact about this is, so why do we want q to be larger? Well, because the encoding has nice homomorphic properties. So if I have f of q plus g of q, this is equal to f plus g of q if q is large enough. So if there's basically no overflow between the coefficients. Um, so in this example, say f of 10 is equal to 4,231, and g of 10 is equal to 1,443. You can almost read of the polynomial of this. Uh, uh, but then we can see that f of 10 plus g of 10 is equal to 5, 6, 7, 4. Uh, so this is 5 to the x cubed, and so on and so forth. So uh, or this is the encoding of this polynomial. So if q is large, then uh, we have additive homomorphisms. So we need to, in the end, in the protocol, we need to choose the q large enough such that all the homomorphisms we do on the polynomial are supported without overflow, such that we can guarantee that all of the homomorphisms uh, work. Is that the 5, 6, 7, 5, and 5, uh, Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, apparently not that easy, even. Uh, yeah, this should be a 4. <laughs> Someone's reading the slides. So um, we also have uh, actually a monomial homomorphism, or actually uh, we can even do polynomial products, but we really only care about the monomial homomorphism. So I can compute x to the k times f of x, 
uh, this just maps to q to the k times f of q, right? Uh, so in, in, in this example for this h of x, then I have uh, x squared times h of x is uh, this polynomial. And uh, we can see that this also works in the encoding space, in the code space. So the second, the next thing that we need, I guess the fourth thing already, is a group of unknown order. So uh, this is some uh, group, and we, we generate this group and, and the generator. And uh, this is, sort of, you can see that the CRS is constant size. It's only the description of the group and, and, uh, and a random element, actually not a generator necessarily, of this, uh, in this group. And uh, the property that we want from this group is that the order is unknown. So that uh, no one knows the, uh, the order of the whole group. And actually, we require stronger properties, such as that no one uh, can compute the order of any single element or a multiple of the order. So why is this important? Well, because if I compute g to the x uh, for an integer z, then I cannot reduce z, uh, this x mod the order of the group. So if I know the discrete logarithm uh, for a prover, the assumption I see it, uh, uh, or in, in at least in generic groups, what it states is that if I know the discrete logarithm between g and c to be some integer x, then I cannot find another integer uh, discrete logarithm between, okay, I cannot find another discrete logarithm between these two elements. Otherwise, I could compute a multiple of the order of that element. And uh, this group also preserves the homomorphisms of, of uh, the integer encoding that we had before. So for example, it's, uh, it's, well, it's additively homomorphic. So, so just to see, I'm following. So the commitment over the integer works, and this is, and now this is about making the commitment smaller. Is that the right? So uh, this is an, just encoding of the polynomial as an integer. Right. And uh, but as we said before, this thing, uh, you know, it preserves all of the information of, of the polynomial. So it's at least p to the d. But now we want to uh, have a short cryptographic commitment to it, and for that we use groups of unknown order, which give us a, a, a constant size. So it only depends on the security parameter, uh, this, this map, uh, which maps integers to group elements. But it preserves. So how do we commit? Well, we lift our polynomial, which is in a field, to the integers uh, with small coefficients. So we really <laughs> commit to uh, not polynomials in a field, but we commit to integer polynomials with bounded coefficients. We evaluate that at q and uh, compute g to the f of q. So the commitment is just raising it to, uh, raising g to the value? No. Yes. So uh, g to the integer encoded polynomial. So we have this, uh, you know, I said for a polynomial commitment, we want the property that the commitment is, is short. And uh, here we have that. It's, it's constant. This is, I, I'm not going to talk about hiding at all in this talk. But uh, you can also achieve it. So, uh, so some people, uh, you know, I guess I'm, I'm using commit loosely. I'm using commit here also for just the binding commitment, not. Special creation is just the second bullet. Then. Right. The, the, the group operations are the expensive. I mean, uh, yeah. And actually, in practice, it's these groups of unknown order are actually quite expensive. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Where we're, we want to make life easy for the verify. So now I'm uh, going to present the, the first an, uh, argument of knowledge that the prover knows the polynomial, which it committed to, and that the polynomial is of a, at most degree d. And uh, we call this a dear 15 argument of knowledge to get a nice uh, acronym dark out of it, um, <laughs> but also because it's, uh, it works over the integers. And uh, so the statement is that there exists a polynomial, actually, it's a polynomial in the integers with bounded coefficients, uh, which has a bounded degree. And the commitment is equal to uh, the g to the encoding of the polynomial. So well, if it's a constant polynomial, then we can just send it to the verifier. Again, this is not zero knowledge. And the verifier just checks that uh, this is, in fact, a constant, so that he can decode it to a constant. And then uh, checks that uh, the commitment was done uh, properly. And then uh, we want to build a recursive uh, protocol. I think in the first workshop, uh, 
then uh, gave the general recipe for getting any log size protocol. It's, well, you do some recursion, you split it into halves, and then you combine it again. So that's exactly what we're going to do. So, yeah. So we're still in the commit phase, right? So no, no, this is, sorry, we're done. This is, commitment is done. And now this is a proof of, this is something uh, different. This is just a proof that, I, it's a basically a proof that I committed to a degree D polynomial. Yeah, but I... Oh, it's actually an argument, well, sorry, it's an argument of knowledge. It doesn't happen before I make any queries, right? Because... We will, I will show you in a second how to then turn this into an evaluation proof. But, so I'm kind of concerned that the, we need to make sure that the extracted polynomial doesn't depend on the query that you make, right? So somehow the extractor needs to put out information that only depends on the commitment, but not the... No, the, the extractor works uh, through, it's an interactive protocol. So the extractor just works through rewinding. So there will be some challenges, and, and the extractor works by rewinding. And it can actually, uh, uh, yeah, it can, uh, so, yes. So, uh, but this already, this protocol already has extractability. So I can extract, if, if the prover does this protocol once, then I can extract the underlying polynomial. <laughs> and, but let's, let's see the protocol first. So the idea is I want to, again, I want to split the, it's a very, actually, quite a simple protocol. Because the idea is just I split the polynomial into halves, and then I somehow combine it and then work on polynomials of half of the degree. So what are the two halves? Well, it's FL of x plus x to the d over 2 uh, times FR. So these are the, the first, uh, the, the lower coefficients, and these are the higher coefficients. And each of them is degree d over 2, round it down. I'll omit the round it down. Um, and then the verifier can check uh, later on using the monomial homomorphism that f of x is in fact the combination of these polynomials. And then the verifier just sends a random challenge alpha and uh, will recurse on the linear combination of these po two polynomials. So this is where the additive homomorphism comes in. Um, so we need q to be large enough to support this. Uh, but we can see that f prime of x is of degree d over 2. So after log d steps, we'll get to the d equals 0 case. Would it be fair to say this is some sort of encoded variant of Fry? I mean, it looks. It's yeah, I mean, uh, any recursive protocol looks similar. <laughs> encoded version of Fry, but actually. Encoded version of what? Of Fry? Yeah. What do you think Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks like it. Yeah, so uh, it's. Uh, um, I, I'm, I'm sure I think, uh, you know, there the check here is, 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 is slightly different, but you could also use a sort of a... a we don't want too many... Exactly. No, it, it, you could also here use a, use a, um, use a uh, like this FFT-based check. Yeah, you could split it into even an odd coefficients and things would also work out. But um, let's uh, see how we compile this to, to a cryptographic protocol. Probably take any homomorphic commitment scheme that. Uh, and well, it, it needs to support these two homomorphisms efficiently, right? Uh, we need the monomial homomorphism, and uh, we need the, the um, we need the monomial homomorphism, and we need the additive homomorphism. So, uh, and I'll show you where the uh, monomial homomorphism comes in, or how. It's like a generic listing technique to kind of if you don't have. Guarantees on degree bounds, then here's a protocol that will give you guarantees right. on degree bounds. So right. Yeah, no, and, and it's certainly interesting if we can, you know, use some other cryptographic compiler to, to uh, uh, ensure that this works. Um, so, uh, the, so this is the, basically the information theoretic protocol, and here we have the, the uh, cryptographic compilation of it. And now, actually, this is also, now we can see how we do an evaluation. Well, it's exactly the same protocol, but in every round, the prover also sends you, so I, I'm claiming that f of z equals y mod p. So uh, basically, in every round, I will also send you uh, fl of z and fr of z, and then uh, do the same linear combinations. And instead of sending you the polynomials in the clear, I'll commit to them using the, 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 the commitment that I described before. So the verifier just checks here again. Here it uses the monomial, uh, uh, the monomial homomorphism to check that the 
polynomials are consistent, and then it takes a random linear combination and, and recurses on it. In the, in the recursion, somehow you need the bound and the coefficients for uh, all of alpha fl plus fi. No, so um, in the final step, I will check that the polynomial is constant size. And then in the extraction, basically, so it's, it's really important, this, this bound check is really, really important because it tells me that the final polynomial is, 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 is in coding of a constant polynomial. And then in every round, I, I can extract uh, just using two different challenges alpha. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. But the, the high level idea is that then, uh, you know, I can, uh, I can see that, you know, the, the, uh, in every round, the, the degree of the polynomial in the extraction, it doubles. In the evaluation, it, it halves. So that gives me an exact bound on the overall size of the polynomial. So, but there's no claim that f prime has small coefficients. We start with an f which has coefficients which are no. The the the, the oh uh, yes. Also, we also need to make sure uh, this is. I'll come to this again in a second, but I'll say it now. This check actually isn't in the final protocol. It's not going to be that f is less than q over two. It's going to be that f is kind of significantly smaller than q over two. Because then I, uh, this gives me, in, in the extraction, this gives me basically an argument that the final extracted polynomial also has small degrees so that it is still uniquely decodable. Right? I always need to make sure that the committed polynomials are uniquely decodable. So uh, this is where sort of all the magic about the <laughs> encoding happens because it's, it's you know, if I, I know that the only homomorphic operations I, I do are this, so this gives me a, a bound on, on how much the coefficients change in each round. So q will be p to the log b or something? Exactly. The, 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 well, it needs to be a little bit larger than that because I, I lose both in the, in the evaluation and I lose in the extraction. Um, and it's actually an interesting question how to get tighter. So there's one issue with this protocol, which is that the verifier needs to do this check. Right, the, the, the communication, you can intuitively see that it's, it's pretty short. Right? I send you two group elements. I send you two evaluations. So I, all of that is constant. We have log D rounds, so, so everything is nice. But here, uh, the verifier needs to do this consistency check. And it needs to compute CR to the Q to the D prime. And D prime is actually huge. It's, uh, it's linear in the degree, D. So this exponentiation is, uh, takes uh, uh, time linear in D. So what can we do about that, right? This is not verify efficient. Well, thankfully, there was uh, uh, the, the best paper at Eurocrypt, uh, the best young researcher paper at Eurocrypt uh, this year, which uh, gave this beautiful proof of exponentiation in the context of verifiable delay functions, which is a protocol for showing that in a group of unknown order, that x to the alpha is equal to uh, y. And the protocol is, if, if alpha is, is smooth, then the protocol is, uh, uh, well, if you, if you uh, count in group operations, it's literally, it's constant, and it's constant uh, proof size. It's uh, literally a single group element. And uh, the verification is also extremely efficient. And it relies on this adaptive fruit assumption, which is a falsifiable assumption. It's sort of the dual of the strong RSA assumption. It says that, uh, strong RSA says that it's hard to take any root of a random element. And adaptive root says that it's hard to take a random root of a given element. OK. Uh, and uh, um, you can also. So there's basically, the, the Christoph Pietzak had basically a protocol for the same problem, which uh, is, a, is a, almost, you can think of it as a GKR variant for exactly uh, this, this problem. Uh, the, the only downside is that it has a logarithmic uh, proof size and logarithmic verification time. So this would get the total, the overall proof size to, um, to log squared. Whereas this one has constant. So it's, uh, it's certainly possible, and, and we, yeah, uh, it's just for efficiency. We don't do that. Um, so uh, now the whole protocol, it's, uh, you know, we want to evaluate at a point. So in every round, the prover sends CLCR, Y0, and Y1, does the 
proof of exponentiation, so we outsource that to the prover. And uh, the verifier checks consistency um, between the y's. This can be done efficiently, right? Efficiently, right? The, all of these operations on the y's are done mod p. Uh, and then we recurse. So the problem is that we, we already talked about this a little bit, that the size of the coefficients grow in, in, in each round. So what we need to do is we need to set, set q to be equal to, uh, Actually, it needs to be, basically, we check in the end that f is less than p to the log d, right? It grows in every round. But this is just log d times p bits. So this is still, uh, f is still small, uh, and it's important for the protocol. By the way, I think I didn't really say this. At the end, we need to, of course, check in the final step. We'll check that f mod p is equal to y. That's the final step. Does q need to have a special relationship with the unknown order of the group? That you're using. No. <coughs> so that's, that's not related at all, right? Yeah. So you can choose p completely freely, and it actually turns out what is a. So q can be potentially larger than the normal order of the group, right? Yeah. yeah. No, it, it probably will be. I guess. Okay. It's a. Uh, uh, it only depends on on p, but it also only it's a p only gives a lower bound to q, mm -hmm. or conversely, if you choose a q. It actually doesn't exactly bind you to a specific p. You can choose p after you've chosen q, as long as p is small enough. Uh, so there's uh, well, that maybe wasn't clear. But uh, let's, let's focus on, on what we have here. And I can go into this later. Uh, so, so in the final check, I checked that uh, the size of this thing is, is, is log d. It basically has uh, log d lambda bits. And, uh, but I need to set q, because in the extraction, the, the, the bound on the extracted polynomials also grows in every round. So basically, I need to set q to be equal, well, not basically, I need to set q to be greater than p uh, to the 2 log d. Um, so what is the security idea? Well, it's a, it's a simple extraction argument where at the base round, I get the constant f directly. And then in every round, I get two different transcripts, so alpha and, and alpha prime for two different, two distinct challenges. Uh, and then I can just take a linear combination from them and say that uh, compute CL equals to G to the W prime minus W divided by alpha minus alpha prime. And this is an integer. And you might ask, A, why does this necessarily have to be an integer? What if it's not an integer, right? What if the W and W primes are such that this is not an integer, and, and uh, uh, the, the answer is that we just as can assume that away. We can break uh, some assumptions if this uh, discrete logarithm is not an integer. And the nice thing is these, these assumptions are uh, falsifiable. So there we, um, the whole interactive protocol just relies on falsifiable assumptions. <coughs> um, and then, of course, we use fiat Shamir to compile it to something non-interactive. So how do you use three assumptions, right? What, is, what assumption is for the result? Uh, the order assumption is actually implied by the adaptive root assumption. So we really only have two assumptions, which is the adaptive root assumption and the strong RSA assumption. And Good. Guessing. What? I'm and uh, if we want a non-interactive protocol, fiat Um for constant on public coin protocols or non-coin? No, it's a logarithmic uh, round protocol. Uh, so there's some issues with that, but <laughs> people have, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of work now going on to say, uh, show in, under which context. We really use it as a heuristic. Um. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, also almost done. So uh, how do we, I said, you know, this whole thing was, uh, was uh, transparent, right? There was no trusted setup. So how do we construct the, and the setup just consisted of constructing this, this, this group of unknown order. So a classical group of unknown order that people use is, is an RSA group. But the problem is that it has a trusted setup. Right? It has a one-time constant size trusted setup. But it has a trusted setup where I need to generate a composite, the product of two large primes. But we can also use this other group of unknown order, uh, which is a class group, um, which has been uh, proposed to use for cryptography a long, long time ago, actually. And uh, the nice thing about this class group uh, is that it uh, is you can publicly sample them. So it's just defined by some 
large random prime. The group size is, is fairly large. It's like 1,200 bits. And we believe that taking the, the, the computing the group order and, and taking odd prime roots is, is hard. Uh, but there's a problem here, actually, which is that wait, yeah, odd prime roots are hard, right? For the strong RSA assumption, what about square roots? It turns out that there's actually a simple, uh, this guy named Gauss came up with an algorithm for, for taking uh, square roots. And uh, I can, you know, usually I pick the prime such that the, I'm guaranteed that the order of the class group is, is, is odd. So I can take a uh, power of two roots of any, uh, any element. So what this means is really that, that if I use these class groups, I don't have a commitment to integers. What I do have is a commitment to dyadic rationals, which are rationals where the fraction is, uh, where the denominator is, uh, is a power of two. It turns out, however, that uh, I can basically also get a, a very similar encoding of polynomials to dyadic rationals, and then the same uh, techniques and, and, and tricks apply. So we need to be very careful with this, and, and, and uh, we are in the paper, and, uh, but it's, it's uh, really important to, to sort of watch for these, these powers of two, because the adversary can take uh, powers of two and commit to dyadic rationals. But again, we basically force them to commit to bounded dyadic rationals, so where both the numerator and the denominator are bounded. And uh, I'll talk about some optimizations, actually, since that I, I have like three more minutes. So uh, the proof size, in every round I said I send CL, CR, Y0, Y1. Well, it turns out that I actually don't need to do that. I don't need to send you CL and, and Y0 or YL, because this can just be the, the, the verifier has access to C. And uh, from C and CR, it can compute CL. And from Y and Y1, it can compute uh, Y0. So in total, this brings down the, the proof size is one additional element being sent in the proof of exponentiation. And at the end, I open this final f, which is also log n times uh, log d times, uh, times uh, uh, log d bits, or log d lambda bits. So in the end, the size of uh, the one evaluation proof is, uh, has good constants. So it's two log d group elements and two log d field elements. And I uh, can do a further uh, optimization. So say I want to evaluate this not at a single point, but at a bunch of points, so a vector of points, then basically the protocol just uh, works uh, almost identically. So I still only need to send you two group elements. I don't need to send you now, suddenly if I want to evaluate the same polynomial at n points, I uh, don't need to send you two n group elements. Uh, I need to send you sort of uh, n more field elements here in every uh, round, but I don't need to send you more and more uh, group elements. And uh, this is important because the group elements are much, much larger, right? They're sort of about maybe 10 times larger than the field elements. So it's uh, two log d group elements and one plus n log d field elements. Last optimization is one that is often used in, in these polynomial commitments when you have homomorphic properties, which is that if I want to evaluate two polynomials at the same point, I can just uh, basically take a random linear combination between the commitments of the polynomials and then evaluate that random linear combination. And uh, sort of this doesn't cost me anything extra there. And in general, what this means, I can, I can uh, evaluate uh, if I have n polynomials that I want to evaluate at k evaluation points the proof size really only grows in k, and it also only grows in k with a, with a, with a very small constant. So, well, I guess log d, it's dependent on d, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's only one additional field element per additional evaluation point. So, in supersonic, if we use uh, Planck, which we'll hear about uh, later, which is a sort of an, an, which is an improvement on, on sonic, then uh, we'll get proof sizes of, uh, I guess 8.4 kilobytes for, for uh, a million gates. And the verification time is a total, uh, is a guesstimate. I think I, I used like 10 microseconds per group operation, but if you count sort of, count up the number of group operation, it's, it's uh, 75 uh, milliseconds for these million gates. What's your estimate on the group time? 
uh, bad. <laughs> so it's, um, no, I mean, the, the one thing that is, uh, so A, these groups of unknown order are, are uh, inefficient. The second thing uh, which is uh, annoying is that the f of q is actually d log d bits because q needs to be, uh, q is basically uh, log d bits. So f of q is not just, you, you ideally would have it be like d times lambda bits, but it's actually d log d lambda bits. So you lose a log factor there. And you can regain that using uh, preprocessing. So if you, if you compute uh, powers of, uh, if you compute g to the q to the i for all i from 1 to d, then you can regain that log factor. But uh, uh, sort of that takes more preprocessing. Asymptotically, the prover, asymptotically, the prover is linear in the size of the polynomial. Quasi linear. I mean, uh, it, so it's, yeah, it's, it's not. Uh, it's not quadratic, but it's, it's quasi-linear, and, 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 and really, uh, you know, it's, we often drop the, you know, lambda terms, which probably we shouldn't, because it's a quasi, so naively, if you don't have pre-processing, then it's a quasi-linear number of, 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 of uh, group operations. So, uh, but if we have pre-processing, then we can get that down again to a linear number of group operations, and, uh, so it's uh, it's basically logarithmic in the number of coefficients. So uh, if it's an n-variate polynomial with a degree d in each variable, then it's n times log d, right? Okay. Uh, an an n-variate polynomial has. So multilinear is going to be just the number of variables. Multilinear is going to be a uh, number of variables, right? Uh, so yeah, but uh, right the the uh, yeah. Any more questions? Okay, thank you. Okay, so we'll take more questions if you have during the break.